Good morning. Thank you. The uh, reading today is from Luke, chapter 14. It begins at verse 1 and it continues at verse 7. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When Jesus noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited you both may come to you and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, he would start to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. When I was invited to preach by my friend Marcy Wallace, I immediately checked in with the lectionary. I wanted to know what the wise council of ministers was thinking about on this particular Sunday and wanted us to be thinking about. The common theme that ran through all four texts was one about a particular disposition of the heart that is pleasing to God. Psalm 81 grieved and lamented Israel turning their hearts away from God, saying, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would feed you with the finest wheat, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. The New Testament selections offered instruction on humility and grace and entertaining the stranger. Hebrews 13 said, be careful to entertain strangers for you may be in the presence of angels. And our focus test today, text today takes us to a dinner party at one of the homes of the chief Pharisees on the Sabbath. Jesus is there and everyone is watching him closely. And as he notices how people are taking their seats, he begins to teach, saying, when you are invited to a wedding banquet, do not take the seat of honor for yourself. Instead, take the humble seat and allow your host to promote you to the seat of honor. You don't want to be embarrassed. There may be somebody more important than you at the event. And if you are the host, don't just invite people because you want them to turn around and invite you to their events, but invite people for the sake of having them there and invite everyone. Invite the people that you're most uncomfortable with. Invite the people that cannot repay you. Now, I'll be honest, I don't think that I need to preach about inviting the stranger to the table today. I don't get the sense that this is a congregation that needs to hear that. And I'll tell you two reasons that clue me to this. The first is that you have a mask requirement, and I want to affirm how loudly that speaks. I have uh, two very dear friends from seminary who have a daughter with special needs named Lucia. She's eight years old. They would love to be involved in the life of their congregation, but they can't be because it's too much of a risk. She's severely immunocompromised. If my friends lived in this community, they could be involved in the life of this church because you're choosing to wear masks. So that means, that says something to me, that you know something about creating space at the table. Another thing that, uh, that clued me off, last week I had the opportunity to worship with you virtually, and you sang a song about justice. The tune has been in my head, and John David, you said that there was not a sound that you could hear that wasn't, um, was it unfamiliar? So I'll just, and God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy. So I thought to myself, if you're singing about justice, I probably don't need to preach about inviting the stranger to the table. But 
I'll cue you into, I'd like to share a confession. Maybe you can relate. Sometimes I find that it is easier for me to sit with a distant stranger than it is for me to sit with myself. Sometimes it is easier for me to sit with a difficult personality whose life is completely different than mine to create space for them and try to find understanding than it is to sit with the difficult aspects of myself or the dis difficult aspects and dynamics in my family. So the idea is that as it gets closer to home, it gets a little bit more challenging. And what does it require of the heart to sit with yourself? So what do I mean? I mean, like the unhealed parts, the fear, the uncertainty, the loneliness, the grief, the rage. Can we recognize when we're enraged and name it? Just allow it to be there without trying to fix it? If we don't create space and honor and recognize these parts of ourselves, they're gonna come out in some sort of unfortunate way. The song that you sang last week was called For Everyone Born by Shirley Irena Murray and Brian Mann. And it had these very poignant lyrics for just and unjust a place at the table. Abuser abused with need to forgive in anger and hurt, a mindset of mercy for just and unjust, a new place to live. So my question is, can we offer this level of mercy to ourselves or maybe to the stranger at our dinner table, the stranger in our close family connection, someone who's estranged from us right now who we love deeply? Can we have a mindset of gentleness and mercy towards our closest loved ones. Because you see, I don't think that we will experience justice in our society until each one of us becomes just. I think it takes just people to build a just society. So let me expound a little bit. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity to, pre, uh, to teach at Rutgers School of Criminal Justice, I taught a class called Race and Crime. My students were undergraduate students and the majority of them wanted to go into law enforcement careers. We were sort of all over the place with different ideas and concepts about what justice is. So one day I came into class and borrowing from Plato's Republic, book one, I said justice, wrote it on the board, what is it? If I had 40 students in the class, I got 40 answers, 40 nuances, because we're all so different. We've been taught to care about different things. So I said, wait a minute, take a moment, and I invite you into this contemplation also. Consider someone that you would think of as a just person. Consider someone that you know that you would describe as being just. What are their attributes? And so the students began to agree on some things. This person is humble. They are kind, tender-hearted, faithful, fair. A just person would not automatically take the seat of honor at a wedding, and they would be kind to invite the stranger to the table. Noah is described as being just. John the Baptist is described as being just. When I think about something being justified, like on a Word document, right, it's being evened out, it's being put in alignment. So when we are justified, when we're, we are just, we're living in alignment with God. When I think of a just person, I think about the pastor that I grew up with. His name is Otis Moss Jr. He used to pray a prayer every Sunday before he came out to preach. The simple psalm, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you O oh, my strength and my redeemer. May my words and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you. It's that state of the heart that is pleasing to God. Last week, your pastor for the last seven years preached his farewell sermon. 
And in it, Dave said, you probably won't remember what I say. But I remember what Dave said. I remember that he talked about all of the great things that have happened here over the last seven years. And he talked about the changes and shifts in society. And he talked about, he evoked one of my favorite scriptures, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And when he was giving us this image, he was describing walking along the Texas and Mexico border in a highly militarized experience, taking one foot in front of the other, in front of the next, right? You don't, when you're just, when you're living in that state of meekness, you're not overly concerned with what's gonna happen two, three, four months down the line. You're literally just putting one foot in front of the next trusting that where you are is where you're supposed to be and everything is in order. And in meekness, there's really strength. So we get it associated with weakness, but um, meekness, the scripture says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Said differently, they shall inherit dominion over their experience. If you were living in meekness, there's no angst. There's no uh, nervousness. You are still and trusting that where you are is where you're supposed to be, and everything is in order. It's a state of surrender. So friends, I invite you into this contemplation this morning, into this space, both as a congregation and as individuals. I invite you to root down where you are, feel the tenderness of the ground, experience the sadness, the grief, the hope, and trust that where you are is where you're supposed to be. And everything is in order. Amen.